KETV News Watch 7, chronicling the stories impacting our community. Stories making a difference. Stories that matter to you. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. You just have to have the ability and, quite frankly, the will to say to even Democrats, if you're a Democrat, say, look, I'm going to go find a bunch of Republicans and work this out. So, can he do it? Can State Senator Brad Ashford, who's now running for Nebraska's 2nd Congressional District seat, reach across the aisle and help break the gridlock in Washington? Well, good morning. I'm Rob McCartney. And I'm Brandi Peterson. This is a special Commitment 2014 edition of KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. Today, we're focusing on Nebraska's 2nd Congressional District, just like we did last Sunday. And we invited both Republican incumbent Lee Terry and his Democratic challenger, Brad Ashford, to spend an hour each with us discussing the topics that matter most to them and to you. We actually flipped a coin to see which interview would air first. Last week, we talked with Congressman Terry. Today, it is Senator Brad Ashford's turn. First, a little background. On him. Ashford's been a politician for decades and has spent time as a Republican, a Democrat, and an Independent. Yeah, his last switch was to the Democrats last August. Also, not the first time he's run for Congress. This video from our archives is of Ashford back in August of '93 as a Republican when he announced his intention to run against incumbent Democrat Peter Hoagland. Listen to what he told us back then about why he was getting into the race. It's been a dream of mine to run for Congress and. Uh, this may be the year to run. He lost in the primary to John Christensen, who went on to defeat Hoagland. Now, Christensen spent two years, or two terms rather, until 1999 when he stepped down and unsuccessfully ran for governor. Since then, Lee Terry has represented the second district. But as we mentioned, Ashford has had a long career in state politics, served two different stints in the Nebraska legislature from 87 to 95, leaving to run for Congress, took a break, and then ser has served as executive director for the Omaha Housing Authority from 03 to 06. Return to the state legislature from 2007 to this year is term limited now, and that is a total of 16 years in the unicameral. Ashford's chairman of the legislature's Judiciary Committee. He introduced several bills on juvenile justice, abortion, and gun rights. He's also fought for legislation that's helped the city of Omaha, like the bill that provided financing for the Century Link Center. So, Matt, many people were surprised when he threw his hat into the ring for mayor in the spring of 2013. This time, he ran as an independent. He finished fourth. But in this race, he had a decisive victory in the May primary. Political pundits said things really started to look up for Ashford when Chip Maxwell said he was getting into the race as an independent. But two months later, in late July, Maxwell bowed out, even though he collected more than enough signatures to make it on the November ballot. I think the, I guess the lesson of the, of the Maxwell effort is that, uh, look, at, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with uh, uh, not only this congressman, but with Congress in general. And the latest Gallup poll shows Ashford is right about that. It finds 55% of Americans strongly disapprove of the way Congress is doing its job. So, where does this race stand? Well, a recent poll by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, a national group whose sole purpose is getting Democrats elected, want to say that, says the race between Terry and Ashford is neck and neck. Is Ashford 46%, Terry 45%. But 9% of likely voters are still undecided, and there's a margin of error of 4.7%. So, with all of that said, as a preface, Joining us now this morning is State Senator Brad Ashford. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for. Uh, where'd you get that those pictures of me back in '93? <laughs> what sticks <laughs> to the video That's stays right. to the video. I've got, right. I've got to really be careful. I know that now into the <laughs> late 2000s I'll still be. Anyway. So well, we look back. We look back back to '93. <laughs> look back earlier. Why did you decide to run this time? Why Why get back in the race? I'm a legislator. Uh, I've been doing this since I was in my mid 30s. Uh, I, I love it. I love the, especially the unicameral where we really don't have any aisles. Uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents, only a few of those, but work together on an ongoing basis and, and we find solutions. And uh, seeing what's going on in Congress, clearly I think that example uh, of working across the aisle when there is no aisle and reaching out to others, it, it can work in Washington. It has in the past. I, I worked there actually years ago uh, as an intern for Senator Ruskin and then for Governor Tiemann. And we, uh, as a younger person, a college age person, and then in law school, I, I saw, uh, very idealistically, I guess, but I saw uh, people in Congress, in the Senate, especially in Senator Ruska's time, 
Democrats, Republicans, very friendly friends working together, getting things passed. So uh, I, what we're going through now is very tragic. It's, it's terrible for the country, and I think we need that example, that unicameral example needs to spread to Washington. Why the change in party affiliation so many times? Well, I, I was actually a Republican for 36 years, so uh, it may seem like a lot of times, but I, uh, I don't think about parties that much. Uh, I, I, those who know me well will, will, will say that or suggest that. Um, you have to have a party to run uh, for higher office like this, apparently. And, but I'm honored to be asked by the Democrats to run, to be nominated by the Democrats. But honestly, uh, I, I'm so used to thinking about issues and trying to find solutions, not positions and thing, on things that I, I really uh, I feel comfortable as a Democrat. I have uh, many of the, uh, the values that the Democrats uh, are uh, talk about today. I, I support many of the issues, but really it's about, it's about finding solutions. So the parties don't. I have a lot of good Republican friends. I grew up in a Republican household, and uh, they have the Republicans and Democrats both have good ideas. So independence. Well, talking the political side of it, Chip Maxwell says he's going to run, and there mm -hmm. was a, the, the political pundits were saying, hey, that split the vote, and it would certainly help you right. as the running as a Democrat. Right. Were you disappointed when he got out? Or when he bowed well, I'll tell you, I, the only reason I was disappointed is I like Chip, and he's not as funny as his mother, uh, Mary no, Maxwell. Mary, Mary very Maxwell funny. is very funny. Yeah. Chip's not as funny as Mary, but I, I, I was really looking forward to, to Chip being in because he's, he's a bright guy. He, he, uh, he's very committed to his issues. Uh, he's running as an independent. He was a Republican. Uh, I think there's a, I, I wasn't disappointed that he got out necessarily or that he was in. I, I, that, that part of it doesn't phase me, though I think his, his comments, his uh, input into the race would have been, would have been good. Really? It didn't, it didn't bother you at all? I mean, because a lot no. of people said, hey, that, was, that would have been the thing that threw the race None over the that top. That stuff doesn't bother me, actually. I mean, I, I'm so uh, used to... to and you, you, you did it well in your intro. We're going to interrupt oh. you yeah, for a your second. Yeah, your mic fell off here. Sorry about that. Oh, clip that one of the TV happened. moments that we have to make sure we have yeah, here correct. Yeah, keep talking. We just put it on right there. That's okay. Yeah, so, so, so Maxwell was in and, or was going to get in, but you say you don't even think about the political side whatsoever. Of, no, I don't. Of somebody even getting in. Good to go. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't. Yeah. I, I really don't. I, I, I uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 well, I really don't, though. I mean, I, 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 I've been... When you work in the unicameral, first of all, your intro was great because it was so, politics is dynamic, it changes all the time, and you suggested that in your intro. So if you get too carried away in the moment, uh, you're going to be very disappointed because he, uh, politics is a microcosm of human nature in many ways. So uh, people get in and out of races, uh, they make a run, runs that you wouldn't expect them to make. Uh, it, it's, that's what makes it fun. Uh, what, what do you tell people who say he's a lifetime politician? We need someone who knows what it's really like for John and Jane Smith in America. You know, I, I, my mother told me never to get into politics. We were in the clothing business <laughs> in Omaha from the 1880s. And actually, I've had a clothing business and a law firm, really, uh, ever since I graduated from law school. So I've, I've had a, a business that I've carried on in the family business, Nebraska Clothing Company. Uh, recently sold it, well, a few years sold it when I went back to the... Uh, legislature, but still have my Bug Eaters product, uh, the old Nebraska football mm -hmm. team. But uh, so I, I've had payrolls. I've employed people. Uh, I'm, small business is, a, is, we have to pay attention to small business because clearly in Omaha and in Nebraska in the second district, small business really is the engine. And, uh, and so some of the things that I like to talk about in this, in this campaign and certainly throughout my years in the legislature had to do with how do we make small business uh, something that people want to get into and, and that sort of thing. So I, I really, and then the other thing that's very, was cool in my life is I left after eight years. And so I knew kind of intuitively, I was in my mid forties then, time flies, but I, um, I, I got to, I've got to change. I, I, this has been great, but if I stay here too long, I'm going to lose, t lose touch. And I, I have to practice, I have my law practice, I have young children, I had to get back. The Housing Authority, um, actually Hal Dobb got me involved in the Housing Authority. That was very interesting work, um, and I enjoyed that very much. So I, I, and we had over 200 employees, so I was responsible for 200 employees, and 
and uh, so I, I get it. I know what it's like to employ people. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one who list, doesn't listen to his mother. You know, so, <laughs> well, she told but, me I would. She said do something else. But let me let me <laughs> ask you this about about the political, the campaign side. Yeah. The last election, I was looking at the numbers here. Uh, Lee Terry won Sarpy County by 10,000 votes over John Ewing. Okay. Lee Terry lost Douglas County by about 6,000 votes. Mm. Sarpy County then is what swung the, if you could say, the election to Lee Terry. Is that where you think you have to win at this time, you have to bite into that Sarpy I'm County. Gonna, I, I, I know, I know. I shouldn't say this. I, I don't. I think everybody is 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 a voter. That every every everyone is a constituent. I, I, I like to ride my bike on the trail, so I got to go across Harrison Street, and it's just like it was to the north of Harrison Street. So uh, I don't want to. I'm not trying to evade your question, but. Um, I, you know, my, my father was a bomber pilot in World War II. He flew a B-26 bomber that was actually built at, uh, at the Martin bomber plant. And he called it the Xarban Knight. He flew on D-Day. As a, as a small child, he took me out to Offutt, to the officers club there. And um, so I, I have an affinity towards the area, uh, playing sports in, in Omaha in high school. There was no, you know, we played Bellevue and all those teams. So I. I know that there is that sort of conventional thinking that that Sarpy County is a tough nut to crack for someone other than Lee, I guess. Mm -hmm. But but I I don't particularly think about it that way. I mean, what do you tell Sarpy County and any other voter? Why are you better than Lee Terry? I'm not better than Lee Terry. I I, I think you know Lee. I, I've known Lee Terry and his dad and mom for as long as I've been an adult. I I'm not better than than anybody. Um, I just have a different way of governing, I think. Um, we've become way too polarized and too partisan. And I think, I think the approach that, that I want to take, which is clearly reaching across the aisle and uh, picking out issues, prioritizing them, and, and uh, I, I think that's the way it used to be done in Congress. Um, I, I, so I, I think Lee and his colleagues have gotten themselves in a place where they can't solve big problems. They can, they can sort of play around the edges, but the big, the big, the big problems, the big things that need to be solved, like taxes, corporate taxes, or like the immigration issue, all these things that take tough votes, tough votes to make. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, I think, uh, t to an extent, uh, people get too complacent within their party structures, where you have to do this in, in order to get this, or, or also the other thing has changed a lot. Uh, since I lived in Washington, although I saw parts of it when I was younger, the special interests, and that can be lots of different kinds of things, but the the big special interests, the big lobby groups, work through the party structures. So what and and what that has done is sort of taken the people out of the mix. Um, I think there has to be much more connectivity back um, to the people uh, that you represent, and that means. You know, in the legislature, I've never gone out to lunch with a lobbyist that I can remember. I always jog at lunch. So, and I, I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean, I, I, I think you really have to try to, you have to listen, but you have to separate yourself from, from that, um, that way of, the way of doing business, I call it sort of the, um, uh, the congressional industrial complex. We've moved away from the old uh, days when Everett Dirksen and Lyndon Johnson or Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill would get together after work and think about what they're going to do. I think we need to get back to that. The other thing is that I see, I've worked under, under many governors. I like them all, every single one of them. I, I've, I enjoy Kay Orr. She was tough. Ben Nelson was a good governor. And Dave Heinemann and I have worked together on lots of issues. But if you're the president or the governor, you're, you're there. You're the governor and the president. It's your job as a, as a legislator to work with your colleagues. You can't default, no matter what you think about Bush or Clinton or Obama or whomever, you have to, I, I've learned in the, in the unicameral, forget about them. You know, they're going to do their thing. If they want to veto your bill, they'll veto it. But work with your, within, within your group, within your congressional colleagues. So that's sort of my philosophical difference, I think. Well, we're going to talk about We want to talk about that. But right now, it's time for us to take a short break, if we can. And when we come back, we're going to touch on some of the hot-button issues of this campaign. 
In July, we broke a story on why plans for a new VA hospital have stalled. The department is over budget in dealing with construction delays in the four hospitals it's building right now. Yeah, Congressman Lee Terry told us he's fed up with the holdup, so he went public with a plan to get the money and break ground now. But current VA policies prevent this so called build lease plan from happening. But the only, only agency that refuses to do that, or at least won't recognize it, is our VA. And just days after that report, we learned our local VA dropped 10 spots to 28th on the list for a new building. Every year, for as long as Congressman Terry has been there, we're, we're always on the list, but we continue to go down the list. Brad Ashford thinks Terry's plan was nothing but pure politics time for the November election. Even claimed the idea wasn't Terry's. Well, we checked. That's not true. The entire Nebraska delegation was in on the build lease option when it was floated in private meetings. Terry took it out public. Terry told us last week he is optimistic things are going in the right direction with the VA now that Shinseki is out. Well, welcome back. We are talking with State Senator Brad Ashford in this special one hour edition of KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. Yeah, I want to get more into the issues. First, let's talk a little bit more about that build lease program. Senator, where do things, in your opinion, stand right now? Well, I wasn't, I, 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 well, I didn't mean to say if I did. I didn't mean to. I, I didn't say it wasn't, Lee wasn't involved. I, I, I'm not sure what his involvement is. I, I, I support it. Okay. I support the build lease thing. I think it's something that uh, uh, we should have looked at a long time ago. I, my history is, first of all, I, I worked on two major projects in the legislature, which has somewhat of the same sort of structure. We're very fortunate in, in Omaha to have uh, a private sector that is extremely generous. And the, we would not have been able to do the Quest Center, I still call it the Quest Center, right. Center, <laughs> Center, whatever it's called now, the Quest Center uh, project without $75 million in private money. And quite frankly, I remember you know, jogging down by the Asarco plant thinking, could we ever get this done? So the private sector made it happen. The, uh, the legislature did play a role, and we did help fund it. The cancer center, the uh, Buffett uh, Cancer Center, the legislature appropriated $50 million for that project, but there was a substantial private investment in that project. I, I love those things. Uh, and so the idea of doing, uh, I believe what I've talked to some of the private investors in this, and it, it's an ambulatory care facility, I believe, or with some other additions to that. If we can get that done, let's do it. Um, Will you as a congressman oh, be sure. able to make it happen faster than oh, I, I don't dropping know. I, on I, 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 I don't know how fast is fast, but, but I, I certainly think that the, my argument on the list and what I was trying to say was that, um, first of all, I like projects like that, and I like getting in there and trying to make them happen, and we have uh, a record of doing that in the legislature, and I'm proud of having led on some of those things. I think you just, uh, and, and you have to give credit where credit's due. If Lee's for that, I'm for, for that, too. I mean, I, that's great. I think it's taken a long time to get us here. I mean, we've, we've been, my, my only argument and point in it is this. You know, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan, we, we've been in those conflicts for a long, long period of time. My, my issue is that when we went in there, especially when we went into Iraq and, of course, in Afghanistan, we should have known or planned that there were going to be significant needs on the VA side. I don't think we did an adequate job of that. Uh, so that when, when it became clear, certainly in the last year, but long before that, that uh, 1.5 million or so new VA recipients were coming online and th the infrastructure wasn't going to handle it. And that's been known for a long period of time. So, you know, let's get this thing done with the private sector. We, we are so fortunate in Omaha to have that element in our community. Let's do it. I would, uh, should I be in Congress, I would vote for the bill to allow that to happen. But I think from a time, it, we, we needed to get that going a, a bit a bit sooner because we, we we knew the demands were going to be there. Yeah, that's kind of that is a little bit of armchair quarterbacking, you know. And I don't want to be an armchair quarterback. I'm not. I'm not. Don't get me wrong. What I what I what I'm saying here is that I think it is it is a defining point between Lee and me is is that I think that we should have anticipated. Mm -hmm. It's not armchair quarterbacking. We knew we knew data wise that there were going to be people coming back from these conflicts. And we also have there's something else that's very important to remember and that is in today's healthcare environment we can determine and evaluate especially in the mental health side, we can determine and evaluate these issues with people a lot 
quicker than my generation, the Vietnam generation. So we knew uh, and have known for some time that these problems were endemic to, to uh, the, the kind of conflicts we've been in. It, what I'm saying about this project is that it sounds to me worth it. To, to, to go forward and and if the for if our delegation is for it, I'm for it. <laughs> well, you, you know, know. <laughs> we want to get to some other issues here. You mentioned the, the the conflicts we're involved in. We have ISIS or ISIL, depending on how you, you refer right. to them now. Uh, we're talking about increased activity. We've got surveillance flights going over from Syria. Right. What is the trigger point for you to okay U.S. boots on the ground? I think we have to. Well, I like where, where we're going now. I like the uh, process in Syria now. The, the hang-up, of course, is uh, today or yesterday. Uh, the discussion about, you know, are we helping Assad by coming into Syria now? Um, and I think that's going to get worked out with a third party, uh, some third party, whether it's Turkey or somebody else. I think we, we do need to intervene in Syria with airstrikes. Uh, I, I don't support going back into Iraq or Syria to deal with ISIS. I don't see at this point that that's an appropriate uh, uh, level of involvement. I do think there's a lot more that can be done. The other thing is, uh, without that, the other, the other thing that I, 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 I sense is going on, and I see support in the House and the Senate, well, clearly in the Senate, to this, is let's, br let's bring the uh, our allies together, uh, our European allies and our allies in the Mideast. I think you have to question Saudi Arabia and Qatar uh, for what has been clearly a funding of some of these Sunni uh, uh, efforts that are uh, terrorist efforts that are uh, horrific. And I think we have to disabuse those two countries of that. Keystone XL pipeline. Mm -hmm. A lot of the argument for it is that we won't have to rely on countries we don't necessarily get along with for foreign oil. Are you for or against it? Why well, I, I guess I'm, I'm the only. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I'm. Forty, my colleagues and I, I think unanimously supported. I hope I think unanimously supported during the special session and prior to that, two and a half years ago, the uh, supported the idea of building a pipeline, provided that it was not on the. Uh, on the aquifer, so I, and and also in our committee addressing some of the landowner rights issues that came up because of it. Uh, I, uh, I now I think it's it's up to the process. I I, I really think that at this point it's up to the process. Uh, uh, there's a state process in place. There's a there's a process in place on the national uh, level, on the federal level, and I think those process, processes need to be allowed to continue. Um, one thing I would say, it's not really the pipeline, but I, I do think we sh that we should really f fight harder for getting federal relief on the CSO project, on the sewer separation project. So if I were to prioritize, um, I would prioritize the, the energy issues that are sort of out there right now this way. Um, I would prioritize the sewer separation uh, issue number one. And uh, quite frankly, we've done a few things in the legislature on sales tax turn back to help with that, though it's a small amount. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's important that we get some relief. And it's, it's my understanding that the city is looking to uh, the federal government for some relief. And I think Congress needs to get involved. I, this, is, this is a tremendous burden. So the second thing, and it really kind of relates to the pipeline a little bit, is the energy efficiency bill. And this kind of is endemic of what's going on in Washington. There was a bipartisan bill in the Senate, an energy efficiency bill, uh, that would have provided relief to homeowners that wanted to make their homes more efficient. And it was, uh, it was a great bill. Uh, it would have actually helped ameliorate some of the cost increases on the sewer separation projects to homeowners by giving them the ability to get grants to lower their energy cost. I think that's the second most important thing to Nebraskans. The third one is, is the pipeline, I suppose, but it's not ahead of those. Mm -hmm. The CSO, it, the, the pipeline is a Canadian company coming through the United States. There's, oil's going to be refined in Oklahoma. It's going to be shipped out, uh, to wherever, China, wherever it is. You know, build it if you, if you have to, but let it go through the process. But the things that affect us here locally should be the first priorities. One of the things that Senator or Congressman Terry talked about is for all of these ideas, you need to have respect, you need to have clout, and that's why he is the better choice because he has that senior leadership now. Why would you be the better choice? It's not getting us anywhere. I, I think the system that that uh, 
I respect Lee's service in, in the Congress. I'm not belittling that. But the, the way things work today, it, it may, in order, it, it, you, the seniority or uh, being there for a long period of time doesn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. Uh, you know, we get into a place where the, the government is shut down uh, for 16 days. It costs the economy billions of dollars. When you go to that place, as a legislator, that is the that is that's waving the wh white flag, and I, I I don't think it seems to matter what kind of seniority you have or don't have. I think I think what really matters is are you willing to work across the aisle, and do it effectively. That means you have to spend probably a little more time in Washington. You have to build those relationships, and I I don't I don't buy the idea that you can't do it. I think I, I so my 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 answer to your question is this that um, working across the aisle, building relationships, working on prioritizing two or three bills a year that you can find allies, whether they're Republicans or Democrats on, and moving forward that way, finding some allies to do that is more effective today than seniority. I mean, you have the Speaker of the House basically putting us, closing the government down. I mean, that, that he has seniority, but the government was shut down. Let me ask you this, though. I mean, one of the most divisive, you're talking about getting together, working across the aisle. One of the most divisive issues was the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh -huh. um, there is still talk about trying to repeal that. Mm -hmm. You get into Washington, if you do, where do you fall on that? Well, it's not going to be repealed, but uh, it definitely needs to be, uh, in many, many, many parts of it need to be unwound and wound back up again. Um, you know, there are parts of the bill that I would not, I would not have supported the bill because it was not a bipartisan bill. Right. So if it came to me and I was the only Democrat, I'd say, no. <laughs> I just wouldn't have voted for it. I'd say, go back, you know, if, if, if you're the speaker at the time, go back and talk to the leader of the Republicans and work something else out or get, stop it. Stop this silliness. Let's, let's have a, bi a bipartisan bill. Uh, having said that, you know, in some ways it's, it's kind of an insurance uh, reform bill because I know in the legislature for years we had a, a state, little state insurance, not little, but we had a state insurance program mm -hmm. that would insure people that couldn't get insurance. It became very, very expensive. It was expensive to the insureds and uh, it was funded, it funded with uh, insurance premium tax. It was just, a, in most states had it. It was just not a very effective way to deal with in, uh, providing coverage. So the, the idea of having pre-existing conditions covered uh, is, is they used to be under insurance policies years ago. That's good reform. The idea of having younger people on the parent, their parents' policies, that's good reform. I don't think the employer mandate makes any sense to me at all. I don't think we need to tax small, talking about small business. Mm -hmm. uh, it, puts, it puts businesses in a place where, gosh, I can't hire the next person because it'll put me into the place where I have to provide this insurance. So I think there's some good parts to this, but it's going to take there is no greater effort that will have. We, in the legislature, we've worked for 16 years on getting health care right. It's very complicated. Uh, so it's going to take a lot of hard work. But I w it's not going to be repealed, so I don't think. And voting to repeal it 54 times, I, I do have a disagreement with Lee on that. I think you just, no, you're not going to repeal it. So, so go over and talk to somebody <laughs> on the other side and, and see if you can come up with an agreement on something. Well, we are just getting started here, but we have still 30 minutes to come out on this special KETV News Watch 7 Chronicle. Yeah, up next, we're going to tackle prison reform, early release of Nebraska inmates, two topics that Brad Ashford has been forced and looking to address this year. Well, we have been reporting for years on the crisis in Nebraska's prisons. But it just recently came to a head with the early release of now convicted serial killer Nico Jenkins and the controversy surrounding the Department of Corrections ignoring a Supreme Court decision and releasing some offenders before they were supposed to. Yeah, on August 15th, the General Legal Counsel for Nebraska's Department of Corrections was forced out, retired effective immediately over the miscalculated prison sentence scandal. An associate legal counsel also retires. The head of the department says he would have fired both of them had they not stepped aside. In addition, two other Department of Correction staffers faced discipline two weeks without pay for records administrator Kyle Poppert, one day without pay for associate legal counsel Kathy Bloom. Now, the two suspended employees do have the right to challenge the discipline. The governor, the head of the Nebraska Department of Corrections, say the four were the most responsible for the early release of hundreds of Nebraska prisoners. And right in the middle of this all, State Senator Brad Ashford. 
Well, I think we open ourselves up to significant liability if one of these individuals uh, commits another crime and hurts someone. We have to go case by case and we have to find a way to at least adjudicate each one of those cases. And State Senator Brad Ashford is with us this morning. So, Senator, where do things stand right now? I think we talked about it the other day uh, when it, all these events occurred. Essentially, the legislature passes laws, and we expect the Department of Corrections to follow them. In this case, as your promo suggests, uh, the Supreme Court on two occasions, once in 2002 and in 2013, said, look, it, the legislature passed mandatory. We passed probably one of the, the most important pieces of legislation we passed since I came back to legislature is LB 63. It was a bipartisan bill. I don't think it received any no votes at all. Uh, and it, it talked about two things. One is uh, trying to set up programs to intervene with kids that are most likely to become violent. And that was the Office of Violence Prevention it exists today and works with community-based groups here. The second piece was mandatory minimum sentences for gun crimes. We already have mandatory minimum sentences for uh, sexual predators, for example, and habitual criminals. So when we pass that bill, which means, you know, if you don't get good time, you serve your mandatory minimum sentence, we fully expected the Department of Corrections to follow that, that order. That's, that's, a, that's the law. Um, I think what's happened so far, the disciplinary action is appropriate. Uh, I believe there, I, I know there's a criminal investigation going on. That's appropriate. Uh, and, uh, and then there, uh, there is a legislative committee looking at these, all of these issues. And then our committee the, the, that was formed under LB 907, which is the, you know, the prison reform bill we've talked about, um, continues to work on the issue. So uh, yes, it's there. The need for reform is, is, is definitely there. Regarding mental health, whether it's Nico Jenkins or these horrible mass shootings, do you have plans on yeah. the federal level to address that? Yeah, there is. You have hit the issue, of the most important issue that I see that's lacking right now on the federal level and on the state level and across the country is identifying mental health uh, uh, issues. 31% of, for example, our, of our inmates are mentally ill. And in the bill we passed last year, we set aside funds for a mental health facility in Hastings uh, for a 200 bed facility that's being designed now for you know, inmates with mental health problems so that they can get help immediately. On the federal level, it's very similar. And uh, it, is, it is critical. It, it, it doesn't, and certainly the Nico Jenkins case signs it, it puts a spotlight on, the, on that fact. So our bill, I don't want to continue to get back into the weeds because you're talking about the federal government, mm -hmm. but similar legislation on the federal side is, going, is being looked at. Uh, prison reform, on, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, particularly in the Senate, are, uh, I, I know Rand Paul and Cory Booker, for example, two younger uh, senators on totally different sides of the aisle, are, are working together on a, a prison reform bill that do, does a lot of what we've tried to do in LB 907. Identify, and this is the key element, who is a nonviolent offender. And if, it, if they are a nonviolent offender, you know, what processes do we put in place to try to keep them out of the population where, where there are violent offenders present? And that's, that's a federal initiative. That's a state initiative. That's, you know, we are one of 20 states in the country now looking at those things. I would very much like to get into Congress and work on that issue. I, I've worked on, as you suggest, we've worked on these issues, juvenile justice and adult crime issues. For a long time, I'd like to continue to do that. Hey, you look at this, though. I mean, there is a a monetary aspect to it, and you don't know, really want to break it down, I guess, to people's lives versus cash. But how do you justify the spending? And have you put a, a price tag on making or focusing more on the mentally ill side and the counseling and the transition oh, yeah. out of the mental? Well, great question, and I'll, I'll give you an, uh, the best number I can. In LB 907, we added mental health to what we call community corrections. We have community corrections in Nebraska for probation and now for parolees. And we've added mental health treatment and evaluations to that process. And the initial appropriation for that part of our, uh, how we deal with these issues is, is in the neighborhood of 5 million to 7.5 million. It's, it's small compared to the cost of, of not addressing mental health issues. Uh, it's $32,000 a year to keep an inmate in the Department of Corrections. Um, 
Well, let me let me ask you. Not to interrupt you, but but you're talking just in Nebraska. But if you get into Congress, how no. do you how do you convince okay. the the other men and women, the other congressmen who are there, that hey, this is that important issue? This is well. First of all, I have the experience working on it. But secondarily, I, there is already support in Congress, in the Senate. Uh, especially not only Rand Paul and, and Cory Booker, but other uh, senators have proposed bills that speak directly to that point. And uh, it's, it's, it's money well invested because we're going to get returns from, from it in the, in the, at, at the end when these people get back into the community. So there are bills today on the floor of the Senate uh, and maybe some, I think there's some companion bills in the House, but the effort seems to be in the Senate. But I, I would, I would relish the opportunity, having worked on juvenile justice issues, and I, one of the things I'd really like to do is um, the cops funding, you know, uh, this tragedy that occurred a few days ago in Omaha. We need to increase cops funding or money, federal grants, back to the cities to deal with these issues. Omaha is, uh, maybe I'm getting off your, your point a well, little let, bit. Well, let's use that as an example. Okay. This week the budget was just passed, and we're dealing with do we fund more police officers or do we save that money and give taxpayers some relief or put it in the contingency fund? Nationally, what's the happy medium there? Right. How do we meet all these needs but fix our tax code, give right. people tax relief? Well, I, I think the city council and the mayor are doing a good job wrestling with that. It sounds to me like there may be some disagreement on parts of the budget, but... Honestly, I think they're doing a pretty good job of sorting through it. Uh, that's my sense of how the mayor and the council, they may not disagree or may not agree 100%, but it's a pretty congenial disagreement. But um, I, when I worked for Senator Ruska, uh, Senator Ruska was one of the founders of the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration. It actually was an agency of the federal government. And what that did is it provided, it provided funding to local communities for uh, to increase police force uh, capabilities and other things. And I know we have some of that now still, but it's been cut back. I, we are so fortunate in Omaha to have had uh, the police chiefs that I've worked with, um, you know, Alex Hayes, Tom Warren, Buskey, and, and, and Todd Schmatter is very first class. As, as were the other three chiefs. I mean, they, I don't know how we do it, but we've got the best, uh, we have really excellent police chiefs. It seems to me what they've done in reaching out to the community, uh, the Empowerment Network, other organizations, partially through some of these grants that we created under the Office of Violence Prevention, but also federal grants, I would like to see federal cops dollars benefit cities like Omaha that have really done the, have done the job to inter interact uh, aggressively with local community. It's a real effort here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we need to recognize that and we need to have dollars allocated to Omaha. We, my job partially in the legislature has always been to fight for dollars for my community and I know other cities fight for their in other areas of the state. You've, we've got to fight for this stuff. Right. Well, there's still plenty more to come in this special edition of KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. We're going to keep talking money. Stick around. You're watching a special edition of KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. Chronicle. A couple weeks ago, Democratic congressional candidate Brad Ashford issued a call to end the perks in Congress. Ashford says it's ridiculous that Congress gets pensions and health care for a lifetime. He says Congress needs a significant culture shift, including a 10% pay cut, and that since elected officials are doing a public service, not a job, they should not get pensions. There should be, we should have a, a clear rule in the Congress. That if you leave the Congress within two years and you start lobbying, you don't get your pension. Period. Welcome back. We are talking with State Senator Brad Ashford this morning. Yeah, last week, Congressman Terry said that if you did that, you got rid of all that, that would be just a drop in the bucket to the overall problem. Your response? <laughs> well, I, I don't know which bucket we're talking about. I know I had ice thrown over my head earlier in the week, but <laughs> basically, uh, no, I, I, I think. Uh, you know, Lee, Lee voted to um, repeal the, uh, the Health Care Act and by 54 times. And in, in that, that, with that, had that been repealed, had he been successful, they would have gone back to the, you know, lifetime insurance benefit. Now, members of Congress get, must get their insurance like everybody else through the exchanges. So, so um, no, I don't think they should have insurance. I, I, I think they should not, they can buy insurance. But, and I think it does, maybe this is my, my unicameral upbringing, 
you know, in order to get pay, and we've asked the public for pay raises. We asked for 20000 right. We didn't get that. When I started in the legislature, it was $400 a month, and then the public gave us, the citizens gave us 12000 We do get expenses. Um, it, it has become a full-time job. Uh, I am used to it. It's, I chose it. I'm not complaining. But I, I really do think 175000 or 174000 dollars a year when you're when you're shutting the government down, when you're passing fewer bills than you have done in decades, you know, when you're when you're working less than 130 days or 40 days uh, a, a year in Congress. I realize people work when they come back to their homes, but I I, I think I think that it's it's time to change that culture. Right. And I had public service. It, that's what it is. It's public service. You don't get a pension when you're in public service, and what you get a pension maybe because you're working at it for in a job. I I think. When I, in my job, if I, as a lawyer, I'd like to have a pension too. It's my job. But when you elect to get into public service, you're serving the people. I, it, it's, it's part of our mantra in the legislature. I realize Congress is different. I still believe that that's one of the obstacles to connecting the people with Congress is p the pensions. How can you, how can you do this? Mm -hmm. How can you walk out of Congress? And Eric Cantor, I, I guess their pensions come in later, uh, at a certain age or whatever. But how do you walk into, uh, walk out of Congress, become a multimillionaire within a week after walking out of there, and then also get a pension? I, I, I don't. That makes no sense to me. I want to hit on this issue before we go to break. Minimum wage, very hot right now. Where do you stand? You know, I, uh, I'll be very quick. I'm for it. I think in 1994. I, I was the po sponsor of the, uh, of the uh, Welfare Reform Act in Nebraska two years before it would, we, we got permission to do it two years before the Federal Minimum, uh, uh, Welfare Reform Act. And the idea was get people off welfare and get them a job. Minimum wage, especially for women, 70% of uh, people on minimum wage are women. The idea is to bring people to self sufficiency out of poverty. This minimum wage of 725 has the spending power of what the minimum wage was in the 19, or less than in the 1960s. So, so I really think you know what we want to do is get people out of poverty and into a job, and the minimum wage just helps do that. I want to ask you real quick back, and we're since we're on money, and I want to get back to the campaign. We do have. I was looking at the Federal Election Commission. We do have some numbers. Uh, yes. Basically, you have, if I look at this correctly, you have $186,000 on hand. Uh -huh. Lee Terry has $681,000 on hand. That's a half million dollar difference. Well, that's more. It, well, it is a little more. Yeah. <laughs> He's got more. It's good math. <laughs> so, so, so uh, how, do you, how do you fight that? I mean, briefly, it is, it, is that a concern? Um, it's it's an opportunity. Uh, I think most of our money is coming from Omaha. Ninety-seven percent of our donations come from Omaha. I think I think Lee's the, those numbers aren't the same with with, with Congressman Terry. And I you know we're going to continue to raise money here. I, I think we'll have adequate money. We're we're, we're having uh, we'll have the money that we need to run a very effective campaign. I, I doubt if we'll have as much money as Lee Terry, but I've, I haven't been there that I haven't been in Congress at all. So <laughs> all right. very good. We're going to take a short break now, but still ahead. The conversation continues. Including questions you want to ask. That and more on KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Welcome back. We are talking with State Senator Brad Ashford in this special one hour edition of KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Yeah, we asked you, the viewers, which questions you want asked. So let's get to them. Randy, you have one? Celia Robertson wants to know. Where you stand, Senator, on same sex marriage and what you think of rulings in other states that overturned the bans? My underlying value system throughout my career in public life has been e equality and fairness. I don't believe that the st state or of Nebraska or any state can deny a license, a license, a civil license to two individuals to marry. Uh, if they are uh, of the same sex or not. Uh, individual religious institutions have, that's the basis of our, of our country, have the, and through the Establishment Clause, have the, uh, the right to decide whom they marry. But as far as getting a civil license, I think that it's an equal protection question, um, and I, I, I think that's where we're going in the courts, and I think that's the right decision. Okay, another question we saw briefly there on the screen. Ted DeLowey wonders how much you are influenced by other party leaders or PACs that give you money with the expectation that you'll vote a certain way and go along with a certain party line. Not at all. It doesn't matter who gives you the money? No. 
All right. In fact, I, in fact, there are p people that say they won't give me money, and they say, well, and I said, well, you know, I, if you if you've got a good idea, I'll still listen to it. No, I, 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 it, 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 if people have faith that you're going to do a good job, they'll then they provide you with funding to help your campaign. That's great, but there there can't be strings attached. What about super PACs, though? I, well, I think that's you mean the the ones that don't identify. Right, they, the don't, they don't come in and they're coming on their own. I don't have any money. of those. So. Well, what if you did? What, I if would, the I would, what if the Democratic Party came in and they said, "Hey, we're just going to do it, throw a ton of money in for Brad Asher's campaign because we want to try to secure that's, this that, that's, seat." That's, that's fine. If they want to secure the seat, they can. But I, but I'm not going. I will make decisions based on what's in front of me, um, and uh, I will choose my priorities based on what my priorities are, based on what people are telling me here. So. Well, another viewer wants to know, we spoke a little bit about mass shootings. How about gun control? Where does that play in? Well, Nebraska, we passed the permit to purchase law many, many years ago. It was my bill. I think it was 1991. And what it provides is that uh, an individual, before they can buy a handgun in Nebraska, must get a permit to purchase from the sheriff. That law has been in effect since, I, since my, my colleagues and I passed that in, I believe it was 1991. And I, Gun owners that I know tell me they like it because they have this permit and they can they can have it for three years, I believe, and then they pay a fee and they get it renewed. So I support the permit. To per We're one of the only states that have it, and I think it works. I think it uh, and it. I, I see no reason why it can't be a federal uh, rule. Um, I think we'd have to do more mental health checking. So. All right, well, we will be right back with some final thoughts. First, though, a reminder, your comments and thoughts are a very important part of this show. If you want to be heard, there are two ways you can do it. You can call us directly at 402-978-8960. Remember, speak clearly. We may use your comments on the air, and please try to be brief. Also, you can email your comments. What do you think about the 2nd Congressional District race, where State Senator Brad Ashford stands on the issues? Go to KATV.com, click on the Chronicle link. Remember, we love to hear from you, and we'll be right back. And welcome back to this special Commitment 2014 edition of KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. This morning we've talked with State Senator Brad Ashford about the inaction in Congress, jobs, VA, prison reform. But now, State Senator Ashford, it is your turn to speak out. We have got two minutes for you to talk directly to Nebraska voters and tell them why you want their vote. Well, thank you. thanks for doing this. This is it's been a lot of fun, and, and uh, I've enjoyed myself very much. Let me let me let me conclude by saying this. Uh, it's been an incredible honor to serve in the legislature for Nebraska Unicameral Legislature for 16 years. I have, to be honest, to say I've enjoyed every second probably wouldn't be accurate, but I've enjoyed 99% of my time there. We've been able to handle tough issues across the board. I enjoy personally working on big systems like juvenile justice. I enjoyed working on child welfare issues. Uh, I, I enjoy taking a, something that looks like it's in trouble and unwinding it. And, and making it work better. And that's why I, I, I'm intrigued by the, the VA and, and the challenge of doing that. I, uh, George Norris was the father of Nebraska Unicameral. In the 1930s, he went across the state telling the voters, look it, we need to have more open government. Partisan legislative bodies don't work. Uh, we don't need conference committees. We don't need political parties. We need, need solutions. We don't need positions. We need solutions. And all the lobbyists told George, he was a senator at the time, they said, George, you're not going to get this done. I mean, you're going to lose. And Nebraskans, I believe 61 percent of Nebraskans voted for the unicameral, and now we have this unique form of government. When I go to Washington, should I be so honored to be voted into this position? The first thing I'm going to do is do what I call the, the unicameral approach to government. I'm going to find 25 friends. I don't care where they're from. I don't care what party they are. People like me that have want to sit down and make a difference by finding solutions and buck parties where necessary and make a difference. The finding of 25 friends, prioritizing the issues, coming up with solutions, proposing those solutions, and making a difference. That's what, what I've learned in the last 16 years, and that's what I, the lessons I'd like to take to Washington. Thank you, Senator. That is our show this morning, and we hope to see you back here next Sunday. Now, remember, we're going to post this show and last week's Chronicle online at KETV.com. That way, you can watch and decide for yourself where Ashford and Terry stand on the issues that matter most to you. Also, want to make sure you make plans now to vote. The election is November 4th. Coming up faster than you think. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week. That's why it's